Good afternoon, Steve. Uh, it's just great um, to have you with us today for this conference uh, where we're getting to combine a couple of really important passions, our passion for investing and our passion for sick kids, um, where, as you heard, I chair the foundation board. Um, as Mo mentioned, though, you had a front row seat to one of the most important financial events in world economic history. And I'm going to ask you some questions about that that I know the audience is going to be super interested in hearing about. But first, let's take a step back and ask some questions that will allow people to get to know you just a little bit better um, and, uh, and how you think about the world um, and uh, how you come to see so many things which, is, which others do not. So going back in time, first role, equity analyst at Oppenheimer, you quickly developed a reputation for being a column as you see them, uh, kind of uh, counter the herd player. Everywhere here, if they didn't see what you saw, wishes that they had. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you look for, what is it about you that allows you to see things um, that others either don't see or they choose to ignore? God, I feel like I'm talking to my shrink. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I started covering financial stocks at Oppenheimer in 1992. Um, I covered all the stocks that the bank analysts didn't want to cover because they thought it was too demeaning. So I covered specialty finance, I covered subprime auto, subprime mortgage, I covered Fannie and Freddie, I covered the uh, investment banks, and um, I like to say that when I, when I graduated law school in 1988, I was an arch Republican conservative, and by the time I left Oppenheimer, I'd become a huge liberal. And, and um, analyzing the financial services industry did that to me. Interesting. That's Tell us not, more. not the usual path. Well, I, you know, I, I like to say that um, <clears throat> the consumer finance industry in the United States is very good um, at creating euphemisms to disguise the fact that they're about to rip your face off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let's take, for example, I'll just give one example. Um, let's take free checking. So when I was growing up, and if you wanted to have a checking account, you paid a fee for the privilege. That was the banking model. Uh, in the early 90s, a bank in Minnesota, TCF Financial, created the free checking model. And it, um, it swept the banking industry. So that every bank every of any size today um, has a free checking model. It's free on the front end. They rip your face off on the back end with fees, whether you're over the limit or late, et cetera, et cetera. And so someone once asked me, well, then why do they call it free checking? And the answer is, well, let's imagine two alternative advertising campaigns. Advertising campaign one, come to bank A, where we give you free checking, versus advertising campaign B, come to bank A, where we rip your face off. Where would you want a bank? <laughs> That's why they call it free checking. Excellent. So you've been in this business a really long time, seen a lot, as we as we heard, front row seat to the to the last big crisis. Um, yet you're now saying, with some level of confidence, that the U.S. banking system is safe. Yes. Um, so what are the key changes, improvements that brought you around to that? And uh, do you have anything to say about our uh, our regulatory uh, situation up here in Canada? I do. Uh, so, um, you know, Dodd-Frank was passed near the end of 2010. Um, prior to Dodd-Frank, uh, I had negative respect for bank regulators in the United States. They just did a god-awful job in every respect whatsoever. And they had two jobs. It was, their jobs were to um, monitor and, and see to the safety and soundness of both banks and the banking system and um, ensure that consumers weren't ripped off by the banking industry. Those are the two, the two jobs, consumer protection. Uh, with respect to job one, safety and soundness, they obviously did an extremely poor job. With respect to consumer protection, they never even cared. They didn't even attempt 
to do anything. Um, so Dodd-Frank split the responsibilities and consumer protection was put in the hands of the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is Elizabeth Warren's creation. Uh, I completely support that. I think it's a wonderful addition to the regulatory apparatus. That is easily a minority position on Wall Street, by the way, but I could care less. Um, and the second job of safety and soundness was really just put into the hands of the Fed for any, any, of, any of the large banks. Um, a new position was created in the Fed, which is called Vice Chair of Financial Supervision. Um, President Obama never appointed anyone officially to the position, but somebody had to do it. So as I like to say, one day on the way to the bathroom, Ben Bernanke turned to Governor Daniel Tarullo and said, why don't you do it? And Tarullo said, okay. <laughs> Unless you think that's a joke. I had lunch with Governor Tarullo a few years ago where I told, them, told him what I thought was this amusing anecdote, and his response was, quote, that's basically right, except for the bathroom part. <laughs> and so Daniel Tarullo got the job of vice chair basically by accident. And he had more power of the U.S. banking system than he was as Alexander Hamilton. And he crushed them. Of course, they deserve to be crushed, but he crushed them. I was skeptical. I figured nothing would happen. But just to give you an example, um, pre-crisis, Citigroup was levered 33 to 1, and by the time he was done, it was levered 10 to 1. He took the leverage down by two-thirds. Um, when a bank is levered 30 to 40 to 1, to destroy it, you need a pebble. When a bank is levered 10 to 1, you need a meteor. That's where we are today. Um, you know, even the, some of the changes the Trump administration has made since then, they've loosened things up, but only on the margin. So, look, I've been doing this for almost 30 years now, and uh, for the first time in my career, uh, I can say that I think the U.S. banking system is safe. In fact, when Governor Trillo retired in April of 2017, uh, I sent him an email. Uh, that was a cute, I should have framed it. The email said, sorry to see you go, just want you to know that you're in my personal bank regulatory hall of fame, and there's only one member. <laughs> That's great. Anything to share for us about Canada? I mean, look, you, the Canadian market, for better or worse, is an oligopolistic market, which has its benefits and its negatives. It has benefits from a safety and soundness perspective, it has negatives from a consumer perspective. Um, Look, I'm short many of the Canadian banks, but that's only because I think the housing market's going to turn over. I, I'm not thinking there's, there's not, there's not going to be Armageddon in Canada, but I think what will emerge is a credit cycle, which you guys haven't had in 30 years. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the regulations here in Canada are fine. Well, that's great. Thanks for, thanks for that insight. <laughs> Moving on to... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would... Uh... I'd take that back to my board if I were you. I'm planning to. I'm sure you, you should. I'm planning to, including the advice on the short. <laughs> like um, I said before, I'm short you. Yes, yes. Don't take it personally. It's not I per don't. It's not personal. Not personal. I got business. nothing against, uh, you people here are very freaking polite. You know, they I got are. nothing against Canadians. So when you say that, we say thank you. A. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the most recent scandals in, in financial services have, have largely been focused on sales practices, right? Yes. And you uh, stated recently in a Bloomberg interview uh, that incentives trump ethics every time. It's one of my best. It's one of your best quotes? Yes. Very good. Um, you then go on to imply that eth ethics have actually also improved. So no, that don't, don't take it that way. No? Ethics never improve. Okay. Incentives can change. The incentives People have don't changed. don't change. So the incentive to act badly has changed. Yes. Okay. And so, so that's... I actually should say that. The incentives within the banking system haven't really changed that much. Mm -hmm. They're just watched a lot more carefully, and they're less levered, mm -hmm. so their ability to do mischief is lo much lower. Fair They're enough. the same people. Same people. Same people. Slightly different carrots. Yes. Okay. Different carrots. All right. Good to know. And a different cop. Different cop. Always helps. Yes. Always helps. In, in the big short, the rating agencies and the third-party regulators in the U.S. are portrayed as if they didn't understand uh, the products they were rating. And you've talked about banks learning. Do you, do you think this learning that you've described has extended to the people overseeing the banks as well? You mean like the rating agencies? Yeah. Regulators, oh, no. all of them? No. The rating agencies emerged from the, the 
crisis completely unscathed. Their, their, their business models were unchanged, uh, the people at the top were unchanged. Um, the only difference is that the securitization market is just much smaller. So again, the opportunity for mischief is much lower. Much lower. But it's, it's, that's un, the rating, of all the business models that are unchanged, the rating agencies are the most unchanged. Yeah. Good observation. So, so let's go back to that uh, that big moment um, in the subprime uh, debt crisis. Uh, there it was, waiting to happen. Do you remember your first moment of, of true clarity on that when you, aha, I know this. You remember that where where you were? Well, you, you, you have to understand, I was waiting for it for years. Years. Because when I was at Oppenheimer, I covered the first generation of subprime mortgage companies, and in 1998 almost all of them went bankrupt for reasons we don't have to go into. Um, in 2002, the second generation of subprime mortgage companies went public and funny enough, it was the same guys, it's always guys, uh, <laughs> that were running this, this, the company, they did just to change the names. So I knew this was a tragedy in three acts. The question only was, when's act three? And act three basically began in the summer of 2006 when, if you looked at the securitization data, the, um, the loans that had been originated in early 2006 had, were going bad very, very rapidly. And that's when I knew it was over. Interesting. The, uh, so a little bit later on in the crisis, you're actually giving a speech at about the same time that Bear There was about, right there. Does right that was there. The, got the about? I got it right there, okay. yeah. We've, we've been trading <laughs> Canadianisms, and, and, and Steve didn't know what a toque was. Now so, I do. Now he does, now he does. He'll be all, he'll be all, uh, all kitted out when he goes to his first Leaf game. Um, so right around the time uh, Bear is failing, uh, in real time, it's, it's uh, falling rapidly, and you're giving a speech. So, so yes. tell us a little bit about what was going on at that moment in your life. Um, so, it's it's a, it's the Friday. Yep. Um, I'm on this panel with um, Miller from Lake Mason, and Bear is literally imploding. Mm -hmm. And um, the scene in the movie is accurate. I did give a speech. I didn't give that speech. I gave I a different see. speech. Um, there is actually a tape of me somewhere in this world of that speech. I used to have it, but I lost it. Um, but I, I, I kind of went off mm -hmm. um, about what was going on. And then I sat down, and the, the moderator of that, of that uh, panel was Mike Mayo, who I'm quite friendly with, who was the bank analyst at the time at Deutsche Bank. This was a Deutsche Bank conference. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Someone brings up Bear Stearns like they did in the movie, and then Mike says, you know, no investment bank in the, in the post-war United States has failed for, any, for, reason, any other, for reasons other than fraud. And I leaned into the microphone and I said, it's only 1040. <laughs> I wish they'd put that in the movie. That's I a wish good they one. too. That's a very good one. That's a very good one. Um, there's a, a fascinating twist, of course, that comes in, in the big short is the moment in July of 2008 when you and a few others start to question the ability of banks to pay if a, if a trade goes against them. Um, do you see any similar risks out there for, for financial uh, institutions today? What would be the equivalent risk if you, if you had to pick one um, where we assume assume we're insured, but we wake up and find out that some of the assumptions we made are incorrect. I don't see that. You don't? I really don't. Um, I mean, look, I'm always looking. Yeah. Um, and there are plenty of things to short out there in this world, but I, I, I don't see any huge, massive um, systemic risks out there at all. I just don't. Well, that's comforting, isn't it? Yeah, thanks for that. That's good to know. Um, take, that back, take that back to your board. Indeed, I will. There's so much of this that, uh, <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm pleased to hear. Um, and you, you said to one of our uh, local newspapers, the Financial Post, uh, at what point, was one of your greatest surprises coming out of the crisis was how quickly the recovery went. Yes. And, and uh, so tell us a little bit about, about why that, that was a surprise to you and, and, uh, and what about that should make us either less or hesitant or, or, or more. Hey, look, I think, look, the crisis was so bad, I thought we would spend a, couple, a while at the bottom mm -hmm. because just to repair things. But, you know, once we went off to the races, everybody didn't, no, nobody wanted to trail, so just herd mentality 
um, they piled on. Interesting. And, and got behind it. Before we leave 2008, um, can you share with us a little bit about what it was like to work with Steve Carell? Um, and uh, I already know the answer to this question because I asked it privately. And whether you think he did a good job playing you? Well, I'm not a good judge of the, the last question. Okay. All I can tell you is that uh, two things. that. Um, Friends of mine who have known me for a very long time said, God, he really got you really good. And, and, but my, my impression of it was that while it was an unbelievable portrayal, I, I thought, you know, I don't know if I was quite that angry. And then three months after the movie came out, I, I read something which was that I had been interviewed by the Financial Crisis Commission in 2010. And three months after the movie came out, and it was, it was just a coincidence, the Crisis Commission did a data dump. They released everything. And um, the transcript of my interview um, was, just, was, was made public. Mm -hmm. And I, so this is like in March of 2016, mm -hmm. I, three months after the movie came out, I, I sat down and I read my interview, which I hadn't thought about in a very long time. And as I read it, I thought, nah, he's right. I was that angry. <laughs> And the only thing I'll say about, you know, I had very little interaction with Steve Carell, but the, the, the music anecdote I'll tell from the movie is just that um, they came to New York in May of 2015 to do the exterior shots. And so my wife and I and my kids were invited to watch a scene. That's cool. So the scene was um, Steve Carell is walking on the streets of New York, talking on his cell phone to his wife, my wife, Marissa Tomei. That never gets old. <laughs> and he's talking, and he's talking, he's talking, and he's talking, and finally he's about to hang up, and they have a, he hails a cab, and a cab pulls up, and the way it was originally written um, was he confronts the guy who's trying to steal his, who, a guy tries to steal his cab, he confronts the guy, and he says, hey, that's my cab, asshole, cut. And so then Steve Carell goes over to talk to the director, Adam McKay, and I mosey on over and I say, you know, not that this ever really happened in real life, but if it were me, I think I would have said schmuck. <laughs> and schmucks in the movie. And schmuck made it. And uh, that's my only contribution to the movie. But I think it's great. The code of the story, which I sometimes find equally amusing, is after watching this scene filmed literally 30 times, my wife turns to me and says, you know, there's something bothering me about this scene all day. And I said, really, what? And she says, there is no way you would ever speak to me for that long on the phone. <laughs> That's really true. That's great. That's just terrific. So we talked a bit, a little bit about that this before we came up here. But uh, current current climate today, uh, how do you see it? What's going on? Um, what are what are your your thoughts for uh, what's going to happen in the next few months? Um, and what should investors be thinking about um, as they reflect on that? I mean, I think this trade war with China is going to go on a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you're seeing the first signs of some deterioration in the U.S. economy. Um, I don't think we're going to go into a recession. I don't think we're even close. Um, you know, my biggest leading indicator would be consumer credit quality, which mm -hmm. is, as you know, pristine in the United States. I mean, it's never been this good. It's actually quite shocking. Mm -hmm. And um, but the economy is not going to grow as fast next year as it as it has this year. And I think what we've gone through October is is kind of a reset to that. And, but the underlying U.S. economy is really quite healthy, so I'm fairly, you know, long-term positive in the U.S. economy for the, for the moment. Look, I'm always looking, but I don't see it. Mm -hmm. I don't see a recession coming. But, you know, probably U.S. growth will be in the low twos next mm -hmm. year. And the long-term impact of a continued trade war with Asia? I don't know. Um, I mean, I think the president is right that we have a lot more weapons than they do. Hmm. The question is, do we have the guts to see it through? I certainly hope so. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to wait it out. But then again, nobody asks me, so <laughs> whatever. <laughs> 
So uh, I'm going to switch topics here for just a minute and uh, move on to cryptocurrencies. Huge amount of buzz around here despite the, uh, the crisis of the past and, and we've seen a lot of chasing in all kinds of different directions. Um, and uh, so how do we think about that? How do we think about what the next big thing is in this, uh, in this virtual, uh, virtual world? Um, and uh, what would you say to people who are holding investments in crypto at the moment? So let me just say at the outset, I'm not an expert on cryptocurrency. Okay. I don't, I don't pretend to be an expert on cryptocurrency, but you're asking me, yeah. so I'll give an opinion. Very good. Um, I'm a skeptic. Uh, I'm a skeptic because I don't understand the social utility of cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, currency markets are the most liquid markets in the world. They didn't. Cryptocurrency doesn't fix a problem that needed fixing. Um, uh, the only um, two things that I can see that cryptocurrency are used for is for rich people to speculate and for money laundering. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any social utility beyond that, so like, count me a skeptic. Okay. That's all I have to say. That's, that's a lot. Um, well, it only lasted about a minute. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the extent of my opinion. But obviously, If well, you dug deeper, yeah. that's it. That's it. But that may be all we actually need to know. Okay, that's um, fine. In, in, as, we think, uh, as we think about that. So um, as you think about the future, you've been very circumspect in all your interviews to uh, carefully uh, not predict any specific issues or company risks. Um, but if you had to identify something, we're forcing you here to pick something, uh, what are the you know, top three risks you see in the capital markets uh, today? Um, and, uh, and what trends maybe concern you uh, that, are, that are emerging on the sidelines? I mean, look, I think the, the, w when the next recession will happen, mm -hmm. the, the issues that will be discussed will be that corporations have levered themselves a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, look, the Fed, by keeping a zero rate policy, um, has allowed zombie corporations to last a lot longer than they should. And when the next recession happens, I, I think those will be gone. Um, but I, I don't see um, a systemic I don't see the next recession being creating a systemic crisis. I think it'll be a garden variety recession where people will lose money. That'll be very healthy. Economic but slow. It is, growth it, slows. It'll be a recession. The, you know, the people will lose money in fixed income. The you know, private equity investors will lose money. The people lose money. The right? old-fashioned kind. The old-fashioned kind of recession. Yeah. I live for that. Yeah. You, you live for oh, that. Oh, love it. Okay. What, what, what changes I, in your world? You have world? to understand, you know, what does it take to be able to short, short things? Yeah. Um, they don't teach you this in business school. You know, they just say, oh, the longs in there are short. That's, that's not how it works. People have psychological profiles. Mm -hmm. Most people are long. They think long, they root long. Um, there are very few people who can root long and short, and to do that you need to have a lot of schadenfreude in you, which is a wonderful German word, which has no, there's no word for it in English, which says a lot about German, there's a lot about English, and what it means is reveling in the misery of others. <laughs> when they were handing out schadenfreude, I got ten times the allocation. <laughs> Well, that makes you particularly suited to the work and, you do. And that makes me suited to what I do. Indeed. Well, if we were going to come along on a short ride other than financial, uh, financials, what would, what would the Canadian financials, what would it be? Well, like I said, I think there's going to be a, a credit cycle mm -hmm. in Canada. So however you find that. And, and there'll be losses. Mm -hmm. You know, there'll be losses. And, and if you look at the Canadian banks, um, what you find is... I mean, this is going to be a little technical. Um, when, they, when they calculate their capital ratios, the numerator is capital, and the denominator is risk-weighted assets. I, I hope you know this, because if you don't know this, it's, that's bad. Okay. 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 You I know got this. it. Oh, good. I feel better. Um, and when you, when you dig down into the risk-weighted assets for most of the Canadian banks, um, and you look at the mortgage books, it's something like 85% of the, it's assumed that 85% of the mortgage book will have losses of 20 basis points or less. And that creates a very, very low risk weight. And so the Canadian banks all look well capitalized. So what might happen is if 
losses, God forbid, are 50 basis points. Like I said, God forbid, 50, oh my God, the horror. But um, that's more than two times what the Canadian banks are assuming. You factor that into the model, all of a sudden the Canadian banks don't look so well capitalized. That's my thesis. Take That's that the back thesis. to your board. Okay. <laughs> Something for us to work on. But really, really good. Uh, really good. So um, the focus of this conference is, as I said at the outset, um, uh, you know, we're combining investing and, you know, doing well by doing good here. Um, we've been talking a lot about preserving capital, growing capital. Um, and, uh, but it's also everybody thinking about how to give it away responsibly. Uh, and uh, all of us, I think, support charities that help to improve communities. Um, tell us a little bit about, about how you think about um, investors' responsibilities to be giving back and, and organizing others to do that, um, and what maybe gives you the most satisfaction in that, uh, in, in that realm yourself? I am not a, um, a practitioner of, I forget what is it called, socially responsible investing. Okay. Um, that's exactly what it's called. <laughs> yes, that's right. I got it. Um, I think the reason why I'm not a practitioner is I, I generally think capitalism has sociopathic tendencies. Oh. And, and so it's sort of pointless. And that the only way to deal with that is to have regulation. I, I, I do not believe that, again, I believe that incentives trump ethics almost every time. So philanthropy doesn't have, philanthropy doesn't have a chance against the sociopathic I, I didn't say nature. philanthropy. There's philanthropy yeah. and there's social responsible investing. Okay. I separate them. Okay. I, don't, I, I, don't not mix, the I don't mix them. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think if you think you're going to change, this, if you think you're going to change capitalism with social responsible investing, I just don't think that's possible. Right. Um, I think a regulator can do that, but I don't think the investor can do that. Um, and then there's philanthropy, which I just think of separately. So, so if we go back to that, that point, how do we maintain the balance? You're saying it's always going to be about regulation. Uh, That's is, that what in, I believe. is that in every industry? Every. Every. No exceptions. No exceptions. I mean, I give you an example. Um, I mean, you can change sometimes, in rare occasions, you can change incentives, but it has to get really bad. So, like, take the energy sector in the United States, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the producers. So, the producers for years were incentivized to drill. Like, like if I told the CEO of Devon, I, I think there's oil in, in this floor. He'd show up with a drill. <laughs> well, we might find something here. Fair enough. Um, now, when oil went to, and, and you know, these companies have been around for a long time, and they never made freaking money. So when oil went to 26, the investors finally said enough. Yeah. And they put a gun to their heads and changed the incentive structures of these companies. And so finally, these companies are actually trying to generate a profit. God forbid. And, um, and so things have changed. That happens occasionally, yeah. but I think it's rare. It's rare. That's, it. That's very interesting. So next week uh, is a big week for, uh, for, for you guys in the midterms. What changes in the market uh, dynamic after, after the election, if anything? I don't know, my prediction for what it's worth is I think the Senate stays Democratic, the House goes Republican, the Senate stays Republican, the House goes Democratic, and the market sort of moves on. Um, the only possibility is that there's a theory out there that says that if that happens, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans will work together on drug pricing. And why I think there'll be some noise. Uh -huh. um, I think the Democrats hate Trump so much that they don't want to give him anything, so nothing will happen. Really? Yeah. So just gridlock across the board? Across the board. And so. Trump will rule for the next two years via executive decree. Interesting. Well, there's not much new about that then, is there? No. It's good to know. We have actually, uh, I see a few minutes left here um, on, the, uh, on the time clock. Uh, is there anybody who'd like to ask Steve a question that we haven't, uh, I can't see you with my reading glasses on, that we haven't covered off? It's dark in here, so stand up if you've got one. Yes, go ahead, please.
China. China. Which part of China would you like me to comment on? <laughs> I had Chinese food. I'm a, I'm a fan. <laughs> I'm sorry, say it again. Chinese food goes without saying we all want it. Yes. How about, um, I'm Jewish, therefore by definition I have to like Chinese food. <laughs> Go ahead. Any potential systemic risk for real estate from not learning from anything else you see in the trade? In China. Yes. I mean, look, you could construct a very negative scenario about China and the fact that it's over levered and there's a shadow banking system. Um, I know this because I've, I've constructed this theory, um, but it hasn't worked. And the reason why it hasn't worked is that China has $3 trillion. And it's hard to have a, 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 a systemic destruction of a country that has $3 trillion in the bank. Um, so, you, you know, whatever trends China has, there'll be slowdowns, there'll be acceleration. Um, but I think it'll go on for a long time, so I don't, I don't see anything right now. Very interesting. Well, listen, that's been absolutely fantastic. That's it? Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. Right. You got more questions. I'm just, I know they're so you freaking polite in Canada. You're like scared to ask. Anybody got a really hard question? Here we go right ask here. a question. Here we go. We got, we got a minute. Yeah, we do. How long is Tesla? Oh, sorry? Tesla. How long does it go? I'm sure Tesla. Yeah, I'm public about that. Um, I think the big test for Tesla will be next year when the, uh, the tax credits end. And my other thesis about Tesla is just that, look, he, what he's made is a company that builds cars for rich people. That's, that's what it is. And so the people who own Tesla cars have more than one car. They all love his car, by the way. When, when I go see my really rich friends in, in, the, in the Bay Area, and I say, I'm sure Tesla, they, it's like, it's like you're, you're talking about Isaiah the prophet or something. <laughs> like, and I think moral offense. So like, I got a Tesla, it's a really good car. Okay, yeah, I know it's a good car, so what? But um, the, the issue is, to, for him to get to the next level, he has to be able to build profitably a car for $30,000. My skepticism about it is, and I'm not a car engineer, so I couldn't tell you how difficult that is or not, but my skepticism about it is, is, is not so much the car, you know, whether he'll be able to build it profitably or not, we'll see. It's more that the person who buys the $30,000 car, that's their car, their only car. That's the car they go to work, everything. And there are always problems with cars. And he has no infrastructure to fix the cars. And so my skepticism is, who's going to be buying that car when, if, if you've got a problem with the car, there's really no place to go. That's, that's what we'll begin, to, we'll see if that's right. Fascinating. All right, well, we, we actually are out of time now, but uh, so thanks very much for that. Thank you, Katie.